everybody doing today? I have to admit, I, I have this lapel mic on here. So I was lip singing over there because I didn't want you to hear my voice that loud. And uh, I just wanted to be open before I start my lesson here today. But it is great to be with you guys. Are you fired up to get into the Bible today? And uh, today I, I'm, I'm hoping to convince you of the reality of our situation. And I believe that, you know, this is what preaching is to do. It's to open our eyes. It's to get us to see where things are really at, where we're really at, and then to go and do something about it. Yeah. You know, let's look over here in Colossians chapter 1. Come on, baby. Come on, Jason. Give me an amen when you're there. It is great to be with the Metro Coast. Let's pick it up here in Colossians 1 and verse 3. It says, We ought always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints. The faith and the love that sprang from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it's been doing among you since the day you first heard it, understood God's grace in all its truth. You heard it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and also told us about your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you, asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from a dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And the church said, Amen. You know, this is an incredible scripture. And there's so much to really dig in and to learn from. And this is going to be the text that we study out here this morning. But I, I love the end of it there. It gives us this heroic depiction of God. Yeah. It says that God has rescued us. We see this all the way through the Bible. Going back to the Exodus. Where it says that the people cried out to God in slavery in Egypt. And God heard their prayers, and he wanted to rescue them. You know, here it says we've been rescued from a very dark place in this world. You know, the Bible is called, the world we live in, many different things. It's called it unholy, unloving, brutal, corrupt, abusive, full of violence, the kingdom of the air, that the people here are harassed and helpless. It is diseased. It has a spiritual sickness. Here it calls it the dominion of darkness. You know, it's a place where the first family, one brother kills the next. It's a place where people sacrifice their children to the bale so that they would have prosperity in their lives. And we still see these things today. We just call them human rights. It's a place where people would fly an airplane into buildings hoping only to kill and destroy. It's a place where 140,000 people drink themselves to death every year in this country. It's a place where one million people a year end their own lives worldwide. It's a place where there are school shootings because people feel so hurt, so cast aside by society, where all they want to do is go into a public place, take other people's lives before they take their own life. And sadly, we saw that happen 647 times last year. 
This is not what God wanted for us. There was not meant to be school shootings in the Garden of Eden when we'd be with our gods. You know, it says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 9, that we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. And when we turn on the news and we look at our neighborhoods and we look at the history of our families, it, it, it's so broken. It's so dark. You know, I have to convince you to open your eyes this morning. You know, you do not live in the city of angels. You did not wake up this morning in Santa Monica or El Segundo or South Central. You woke up this morning in a dominion of darkness and God wants to rescue you. And this is the time of my lesson for you today. Rescued from the dominion of darkness. You know, God has a plan for your life. He wants to pull you out of all these things that you could rewrite history, that you could change all that has happened in the history of our families. And we can do something very different with our lives, very different with our children. You know, when we're young, we naturally think that we're not going to be like our parents. But don't you think that they thought like that when they were young too? You know, they don't have the saying that apple doesn't fall far from the tree for no reason. And if we want to do something different with this generation and the opportunity that we have, it's going to take each one of us making a decision to do something very different with our lives. Yes. You know, I just have a couple points for you today from this passage. And my first point is remember the dominion. Wow. Let's pick it back up in verse 3 and read it again. It says, we always thank God. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and the love that sprang from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. You know, here it tells us that actually Paul never met the people in this church. He never met the people in Colossae. He heard of them from Epaphras, who was somebody who was in prison with Paul. And he goes, hey, I, I heard about this, and I've heard about your, your love that you have for all the saints. And he goes, hey, and I also heard about the, the faith and the love that sprang from the hope. You know, this talks about the trinity of God's character, faith, hope, and love. Yeah. But what's interesting is that it says the faith and the love came from the hope. Not like it says in 1 Corinthians 13 where it says, you know, there's faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. It actually says those two came from hope. Wow. And I remember when I first started studying the Bible, I didn't have faith. I can promise you that I was an atheist. <laughs> I definitely didn't have a biblical love. I was a very selfish person. But as I started to get into the scriptures and people started to apply them to my life, there was a flicker of something was ignited in my heart and it was hope yeah. it was hope that I could finally find the truth of what life is all about yeah. what are we on this rock for yeah. that I could have a purpose to my existence that wouldn't just be about getting money or getting a car or getting pleasure that there was something beyond and bigger than all that Hope that I could change. Hope that I could actually be a good person. Hope that my life and my family could change. Hope that I could have an impact on this world. Hope that one day, even me, that I could go into the beyond and be with God in heaven. It all came from hope. Do you remember that day? When you first felt that hope? And I think sometimes we forget where we were at before, and all that God did to get us to that moment. I mean, you hear so many stories of people who get up here when they say Jesus is Lord, and they tell you how they came to become in contact with a disciple, and it's always this incredible story. That, man, I, I said this prayer like three days before, and I said, God, please show me the truth, or God, please do this, or this turn of events, and it talks about in Acts 17 that God sets the exact times and places. And he's never far from us, but he's wanting to give us a chance to hear the truth and really get our lives right with him. Yeah. It talks about in Romans 5 also, it says, you see, at just the right time, while we're still powerless, God was watching you and waiting for a perfect turn of events to come into your life. Yeah. 
You know, God's timing is always awesome and perfect. You know, I think of for myself, you know, I didn't grow up a a, a God-believing person, quite the opposite. I was very antagonistic towards God. I didn't like the idea that I had some person in the sky that I had to, like, answer to one day. I wanted to have, you know, be my own God and then kind of do whatever I wanted to do. And so probably at the age of 11, I thought I was an atheist. And it it sat well with me because there was no responsibility then. I could just do whatever I wanted. Uh, when I was 16, I met a, a, a girl that w- grew up in a church of real disciples. And she didn't want anything to do with it either. And so we started dating. And then we moved from Florida to California. And we, we had our, a, a daughter there at 19 years old. And then as she was, you know, getting ready to have a, a child, she ran into this couple that had a shirt that was affiliated with the church of disciples that she grew up in. And she started thinking about God and started thinking about these things. She's about to have a baby. I'm not thinking about nothing, you know. And so this family takes her out to church one week. And I'm like, you're not going back to that church. And so the next week they came to, t- to ask her to come out again. We're living in a, a studio apartment in downtown San Diego. So there's nowhere to hide in the place. So I closed the blinds and I made her get down. down, And we just did not answer the door at all. And eventually they went away. But that's where I was at. And God had to set the stage to move in my life to get me to the point where I was humble and willing to actually sit down and study the Bible. But looking back at it now, 24 years later, it was just the perfect time and the perfect turn of events. In the same way, if you're here today, it's not by chance. It's not by chance that maybe you were invited out by some random stranger or you came in contact with a disciple. God has you here and he wants you to hear a message this morning. You know, I got to ask you, for those who are disciples, have you begun to forget the dominion? Have you forgotten where you came from and where you're at when God came into your life? You know, let's turn over here. Let's go back to the beginning. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Genesis. In verse 1, it says in verse 1, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. You know, a lot of people read this, and we go, wow, this is this ancient kind of fairy tale folklore on how the universe came to be. But here, it it not only tells us how we all got here today, but it tells us not only that, but also how God came into your life. This is the creation account, but it's also the account of someone who becomes a true follower of Jesus. It says, like in Acts, that God is there the whole time, just hoping that he can come for him and perhaps find him. I'm sorry, this thing's not working. It's, it's booming, and it's just, it's just not awesome. And here, it gives, it gives a, a, a depiction of this big ball of deep, formless, dark water. And God's hovering over the surface of the deep. And this really is supposed to represent who you were before God came into your life. It says in Psalm 18, verse 16, he reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. It says in 1 Peter 2, verse 9, it says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you declare to praise Him and call you out of darkness and into His wonderful light. And there you were, 
pointless, purposeless. You had nothing going on but darkness. And God was hovering over you for 18, 19, 20, 25, 30 years, 40 years, just watching the waters get deeper and darker, waiting for that perfect moment to say those four magical words, let there be light. And God came into your life. It says in 2 Corinthians 4, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God displayed in the face of Christ. Somebody brought the light of God into your life. And it absolutely changed everything. This is our story. God rescued us. You know, this morning I was looking at uh, incredible rescue stories. And there was a story of baby Jessica in Midland, Texas in 1987. She was a year and a half old, old and she fell down a well and was there for almost three days. And they were able to retrieve her from this 22-foot well and they brought her out and they brought her from this dark place into the light and she survived and she went on to talk about it as she became an adult. She says, you know, I don't remember anything from it, but I still have the scars and I, I, I take great pride in my scars because I survived, wow. because I was rescued. But that's your story. Wow. You're in a deep, dark place and God reached down and he pulled you out of that darkness wow. into his wonderful light. Wow. You know, I'll never forget, years ago, I think God allowed me to go through something to sear this into my heart, to never forget the dominion of darkness. And uh, when I got restored in 2010, I wanted to date Sarah, just to let you know. And, uh, and Kip was very upfront with me. He goes, hey, if you want to date Sarah, I want you to go through CR. And I, so I was very motivated at that point. And uh, I was living in Long Beach at the time. We only had one CR class. If you don't know what CR is, chemical recovery. And I did come from a you know, history of substance abuse. And so I would drive every Saturday from Long Beach into Hollywood to go to Ryan Caceres' CR class. And uh, I, I remember it was an incredible time. And uh, if you go through it, you kind of have a sponsor. You have a mentor that takes you through it. And Nick Bordieri was my uh, CR sponsor. And Chemical Recovery, the program consists of widely a, of you writing a journal. And the idea is that you write a journal of every time you used, like every time. I mean, the idea is that you would write it for even days. You'd, and it, it was very specific. You had to write it in like four-hour blocks because you really had to get deep into it and try and com really connect the, the use with the pain and, and what got you there. And I remember I, I started writing my journal. I stuck to the program, did it in a long, you know, four-hour block, did it over, had several, many pages of this journal. And the idea is that you then come into this group setting and you read your journal in front of everybody. And, and it's very vulnerable, very open. And there's kind of an unspoken rule that you need to cry when you read this journal, all right? It's got to hit you in the heart. And so... I read the journal, and I, I, I put my head down. I just started reading. It, it felt like, you know, you know, presidents changed office. Uh, that's how long it took. And after maybe 15, 20 minutes of reading, I came up just exhausted. I was like, what do, you, what do you think, guys? And I remember Ryan goes, bro, that was an awesome journal. But I wasn't crying yet. And then all the other brothers started to share. And then I looked at Nick Bordieri, and if you, never, if you don't know Nick Bordieri, he's, he's kind of a, a little guy, he's an Italian guy, and he's super heartsy. And he looks at me, and he's already crying. Now, I feel bad that he's crying for me for my journal. And so he, he goes, Jason, never forget. And then I start crying. And that moment will never leave me. He told me, he said, Jason, never forget. And to this day, I never forget the dominion of darkness I came from. I know how bad life can get. I know how dark it could be. Maybe even some of us today are thinking about calling it quits 
with God. There's, there's nothing to go back to. It's so dark back there. It, 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 it's, it's endless darkness. Make a decision today to remember the dominion of darkness. Repent and draw close to the light of God. You know, it talks about it in Nehemiah 9. It says, they refused to listen and failed to remember the miracles you performed among them. You know, we could even start to take it for granted the miracles God is doing. You know, we're going to see two more souls get saved today. It's a miracle of God to see that we've had 65 baptisms already this year. We're on pace to have over 600 baptisms restorations for the year. I mean, it's incredible. And God is calling us today, do not fail to remember the, all the miracles that he is performing amongst us and to remember the dominion of darkness. You know, if you're a disciple, I really want to call you to this week, get with those, someone who, you know, mentors you or even somebody else and just tell them your conversion. Tell them how you're met. Tell them of the Bible studies. Tell them how it changed your life. And just remember what God did in your life. If you're a guest here today, we're so honored to have you. And God has an incredible plan for your life as he does for our life. And he wants every person in this world to come into his light. And I really want to, you know, call you as a, as a humanitarian to study the Bible. Because here it says, what was that light supposed to represent? It would be the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. And God wants to show you his light. He wants to say those magical words in your life. Let there be light. Study the Bible today and become a true disciple of Jesus. In Psalm 77 verse 11 it says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. Let us remember today. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And we're going to pick it back up in verse 6. It says, All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you first heard it, understood God's grace and all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ Jesus on our behalf, who also told us of your love in the Spirit. My second point for you today is rescued to become a rescuer. You know, here it says that Epaphras, he, he got rescued, and then he started the church there in Colossae, and now Paul is meeting him. And see, this is something that we have to understand about Christianity. It is a pay it forward doctrine. This is what we teach with discipleship, that you make a disciple, and now that person is not a churchgoer. They're not a fan of Christianity. They're a true disciple. And now their purpose is to go make disciples. So you have one disciple makes a disciple, makes a disciple, makes a disciple. And even from just a couple people, you could create a sweeping movement that can evangelize the nations in one generation. You know, it works. You know, there's a movie that came out, you know, many years ago called Pay It Forward. Whoever saw this movie. So we had Kevin Spacey and Haley Joe Osment, and uh, it's a, a great movie about this seventh grader in Las Vegas whose social studies teacher says, I want you to think about how you can change the world and then put something into action. So this kid goes back and he goes, all right, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a, an act of kindness to somebody that is so big. It's not a small thing like give somebody a dollar. It's got to be major. It's got to be meaningful. It's got to make a difference in that person's life. He goes, I'm going to do that, but then I'm going to challenge them to do that to three more people. Who will then challenge those people to do it to three more individually, and it'll go on and on. And the movie starts with like this random act of kindness, and you don't really know you know, why the person did it, and the person says, somebody did something to me, and now I'm paying it forward to you. And the person is so impacted by it, he goes... Where did this start? Who was the first person to do it? It was the seventh grader. Wow. 
And what he did is he brought a homeless person into his garage, let him stay there, and he fed them, and he took care of them, and he, he helped him get back on his feet, and then challenged him to do something else. And he did these things to other people, and it became this sweeping kind of movement that was making its way around the world from one seventh grader who is going to pay it forward. Wow. See, it's the same thing in Christianity. You, you can't just come in here and, and, and take this. You have to go out and pay it forward and do something about it. You know, we, we know that King David was somebody after God's own heart. And he goes to, you know, rescue the sheep. And he then gets rescued from the, the hand or the paw of the bear and the lion. And he saw that God rescued him from that. And then he goes up against Goliath and he said God rescued him from Goliath, but he was rescuing the people of Israel. And we see this rescuing and being rescued and it goes around and around and around and we could change the world like this. You know, it talks about in 2 Corinthians, it says, as God's co-workers, we urge you do not receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the, in the day of my favor, I heard you. In the day of salvation, I helped you. Now I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. He says, if we just come and we don't pay for it, we just try and take. But we don't go do something about it. Man, it says we're taking it in vain. It's worth nothing to us. Let's turn over here to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Yeah. And we're going to pick it up here in verse 14. It says, Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. But some of them said, By Beelzebub, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. Jesus knew their thoughts, so I hope you have good thoughts today, because Jesus knows what you're thinking about. It says, I saw this sweater, by the way, on, like, Facebook. It, was, uh, it had, like, Jesus poking around a corner. It says, I saw that. <laughs> Just want to put that out there. It says, verse 17, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself... How can his kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebub. Now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then they'll be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. When a strong man is fully armored and guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up the spoils. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. A lot of people, we, we miss the significance of what Jesus is saying here. Here they're accusing Jesus of doing good through the power of Satan. And he uses a very reasonable argument to shoot down that theory. He goes, hey, okay, well, a house divided against itself is going to fall. So, and any house is like this, whether it be Satan's house or God's house. And he goes, if I'm driving out demons, which would be fighting against the forces of darkness, but I'm doing it by the forces of darkness, then that would be Satan fighting against himself. That's a bad battle strategy. His house is definitely going to fall. But then he goes, but if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. And sometimes we, we, we go, well, what is the finger of God? Well, if you go back to during the time of Moses, when he brought down the first written words of God, it says that God's finger engraved it into the stones. And so what he's saying is that we could take this thing right here, the finger of God, the words of God, and we can drive out demons with it. And he says, and if that's what we're doing, then the kingdom of God has come to you. Let me tell you what, my brothers and sisters, we are getting persecuted now more than we probably have been in over 30 years. And I believe that the closer we get to victory, the more fierce the persecution is going to be. Jesus' worst persecution was him leading into the cross. 
the apostles, as you got through the book of Acts, they eventually had to appeal all the way to Caesar. It got thicker as they go. And right now, as we see all that God is doing in the Operation Jerusalem and 30 plantings around the world, Satan is going to do anything he can to oppose us. But we've got to have the conviction of Jesus, knowing that we're bearing crude fruit for the Lord and we have brought the kingdom of God. He then goes on to say, he goes, when a strong man is fully armored, he guards his possessions. But someone stronger can tie him up and steal that possession away. This is supposed to represent Satan. It's, it's also kind of emblematic of Goliath. He was the satanic character who was fully armored. And his possessions are the souls of men and women. And here it says, with God's word, you are actually stronger. It says in Corinthians that we can outwit Satan. And we could tie him up for a moment, and we could then steal a possession away from him, which is a soul or a man or woman. And today, we stole Odero's soul back to God, and we stole Aris's soul back to God, and they're going to get baptized. We tied up Satan just for the day, and we're able to rip that away. And then it goes on, whoever does not gather with me scatters. Whoever's not with me is against me. So if you go, well, oh, that's cool, dude. You're in the full-time ministry. That's awesome. I, I support you. I mean, I gave contribution. I support you. You, you missed it completely. Christianity is not a spectator sport. It's not. We don't have a stadium to come and cheer for. You've got to come into the house of God, roll up your sleeves, pick up your sword, and you've got to go out and do something about the forces of darkness. Otherwise, you've believed in vain. My main goal here today is to get you to go do something. If you could pay it forward and then call them to do the same, watch what we could do in the city of angels. Maybe one day it will be emblematic of its name. One day we can have a church of thousands of disciples. They're praising God. Let's turn back to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And we're going to pick it up in verse 9. It says, For this reason, since the day I heard about you, I have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious riches that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of God. Of light. You know, here he goes, I pray that God would fill you with the knowledge of his will. What is God's will? He wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. He, he doesn't want you just to know that. I think everybody here, you know, knows, okay, we got to go make disciples. The question is, are you filled with that? Is that what your life is about? You know, I actually forgot to read the part back there in Luke 11 because it, right after it talks about whoever does not gather with me scatters, it says, when an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes into arid places seeking to find rest. And when it doesn't do that, it comes back to the house in which it left and it'll find it swept clean and put in order and it'll bring seven more spirits back and they'll go and live there and it'll be worse for that person in the end than it was in the beginning. And what is it saying? It's saying when you become a disciple, an evil spirit goes out of you. It leaves you. I don't know about you, but I had an evil spirit in me. If you don't think so, then you're just out of touch with where you're at in the dominion of darkness. Because it talks about in Ephesians 2, it says there's a spirit of disobedience that's in you. And, and those guys, when they studied the Bible with me back in Tampa, Florida, 1998, they drove that spirit out. Through God's word. It was an exorcism. <laughs> and now, it, it went out. But it comes back. 
and it looks to see, are you just dressed in your Sunday best and playing church? Or have you filled your house up with all that God would call you to do? Christianity is not just about a bunch of stuff you don't do. It's as much about a bunch of stuff that you go and do. And when he comes back and finds you just playing church, he goes, hey, seven more spirits. Look at, he's playing church. Let's go back and live there. And it says it'll be worse in the end than it was even in the beginning. I've lived out that scripture. I've fallen away and gone and did more things, more sin, more darkness, more hopelessness, even than when I were, where was at before I ever studied the Bible. See, the question is not, are the spirits coming back? The question is, what's going to be the condition of the house when they get there? Is your house going to be full, full of the will of God? Full of the knowledge of the will of God. You know, it could start today. All it, all it takes is you opening your mouth at Target. Wow. All it takes is, you know, that uncomfortable moment where they're ringing you up. You're like, oh, am I going to do it? Oh, am I, gonna not? I don't know if they, they, they don't look open. They don't, I don't really think, oh, they got that unopened look, you know. <laughs> like, we think we know. Like, oh, body language is off. And we, and we talk ourselves out of it and just tell them, going, no, I'm going to share my faith with this person. And you know what? Then I'm going to care enough to actually follow up. And if that person's not open, it says shake the dust off your feet and go to the next one. And you just keep doing that. And one day, you're going to meet somebody who has a good and noble heart that wants to be a disciple. Man, and it's going to change your life as it changes theirs. You know, I've always said evangelism's like golf. You ever play golf? Golf is extremely difficult. And so is evangelism. And I've played enough time to where, like, 95% of the time, you have no idea what happened. You're like, oh, please. <laughs> and it could go anywhere. But, you know, on that, like, 100th time, you hit it, and it goes straight, and it lands on the green, and you go, oh, my gosh, golf is the greatest game in the world. In the same way you meet 99 people are not open. And then you meet that one noble soul who studies the Bible and gets baptized. And you go, wow, evangelism is the greatest thing in my life. You know, I, I really want to lift up uh, the Oradolas. And I, I hope this service has, has measured up to last week's service. But, you know, this is a couple that is full of the knowledge of God's will. This is what their life's about. They pour themselves out every day. And I was in their life before they were in the full-time ministry. They were still like that. You know, I want to lift up the Rodriguez's. This is a couple that's pouring themselves out every day to seek and save the lost. You know, I want to lift up Alan Ramos. This is a guy who shares his faith everywhere he goes. He shared his faith with me on my way to church today. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, he's filled with it. What could this group do if every disciple got filled with the knowledge of the will of God? And they didn't just keep it to himself, but went and did something about it. Because God has rescued you to be a rescuer. You know, it goes on in verse 10, it says, and to live a life worthy. If you're going to make it to heaven one day, and God's going to put that crown on you, there's, there's a life that gets you there. Jesus said in Revelation, it says, those who are worthy will earn the right to sit with me. And that will come from paying it forward. Laying your life down to win as many as possible. You know, let's close out here in verse 23. It says, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope that is held on the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, have become its servant. You know, here they make the declaration about 30 years after the church has started, and Michael talked about there in Acts 2, they say every creature 
has heard. Not meaning that they, they preach to like the squirrels and the, the raccoons. The Greek here is mankind. It says all mankind has heard this gospel. They, did, they got the job done in the first century. You know, Tertullian was a second century Christian writer. He says, he says but we are of yesteryear. And yet we already filled your cities, islands, camps, your palace, senate, and forum. We have left you only your temples. Wow. Talking about the Greek mythical temples. And in the years after that, those came toppling down too. Because you're not going to find a, a Greek mythical temple anymore in modern society. Why? Because the first century disciples flat demolished those strongholds with the truth of the gospel. Our first century brothers and sisters got the job done. They won the world in their generation. The question is, are we now in the 21st century going to follow in their footsteps? Are we going to be able to say one day that we laid our lives down, that we won the world, that we were willing to do whatever it took, we were willing to go wherever we had to go, we were willing to give up whatever we had to give up, because we knew that our God had rescued us from a dominion of darkness. I love you guys very much.